Okay, so welcome all to uh, this evening's BOMS educational webinar, which is kindly supported uh, by Medtronic, and we're very grateful for their support. Uh, also grateful to be joined by my uh, super colleague, Peter Small from Sunderland, who will help me co-chair uh, the session tonight. And ahead of tonight's talk, I'd like to give you two dates uh, for your diary. Uh, the next journal club will be uh, on Wednesday, the 12th of May, 8 p.m. as usual, and that will be run by uh, the Birmingham MDT. And the next educational webinar will be Wednesday, the 26th of May, uh, and that will be delivered by Ali Aminian, um, our colleague from Cleveland Clinic, and he should be giving a super talk. Uh, but back to tonight. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Tom Barber, uh, who is an associate professor and honorary consultant endocrinologist in University of Coventry in Warwickshire. He leads the obesity service uh, in Coventry. And he's also the scientific lead for the Human Metabolism Research Unit. He has a, an avid interest in genetics and mindfulness. Uh, he's spoken and taken part previously at the EMBMI Symposium, and he does a fantastic lecture. So I'm thoroughly looking forward to his talk. Uh, as always, the talk will be recorded so it can be sent to all the BOMS membership. Uh, it'll be on YouTube. Please post your questions via the Q&A function. And I promise uh, that we will finish at 8.45 sharp and we'll have around 15 minutes for questions at the end. So thank you all and enjoy. And uh, Tom, the floor is yours. And thank you very much for doing the talk tonight. Great, thank you for that. I'm going to uh, share my screen now and hopefully you can see that. Uh, I'd like to thank um, Mr. Awad for his very kind invitation uh, for me to deliver this talk and the uh, BOMS Council as well. Uh, I'd also like to share my uh, thanks to uh, Med Medtronic. Sorry to interrupt, um, Tom. If you just want to swatch your, switch your screens over, we've got your draft, the black one. Oh, sorry. Uh, share screen. Uh... Can you see that now? Uh, we, if you click display settings at the top and then just swap swap your screens, we, we show, we're seeing the draft slide, not your presentation. Can you see that now? It's just loading. Yes, perfect. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Medtronic as well. Uh, and as you've heard, the, the title of this uh, talk uh, is uh, Pathogenesis and Novel Management Strategies for Obesity, uh, Lessons from uh, Genetics and uh, Mindfulness. <clears throat> Here's the outline of the presentation. Uh, I'm going to firstly consider why we should uh, uh, think about genetics of obesity, why we should be concerned about this. Uh, we're going to think about monogenic forms of obesity, uh, polygenic forms. We're going to consider some data from genome-wide association studies. We're then going to think about appetite regulation, uh, a focused uh, discussion on hypothalamic appetite regulation and the relevance for that will become apparent during the talk. We're then going to think about epigenetic uh, factors and metagenomics. And as a segue between the two elements of the talk, I'm going to talk about maintenance and the challenges of maintenance of body weight. And finally, uh, to talk about mindfulness as a novel factor in the management of obesity. So for quite, quite a lot to get through in the next half hour. And there should be a kind of 10 minute uh, Q&A session at the end as well. So why should we study the genetics of obesity? What's the point? If we look at the media, it seems to suggest that it's all down to lifestyle. It's all down to what we eat. Too much fat, too much sugar, not doing enough exercise. We're too greedy. That's the reason we've all uh, become obese. You know, there's no mention of, of genetics or very rarely any mention of genetics, which I find truly remarkable because actually the heritability of BMI is between 70 and 80 percent. It's an incredibly relevant part of the pathogenesis of obesity. What does heritability actually mean? What it actually means is that where you sit on this Gaussian distribution is largely genetically determined. So in any population, there's this normal distribution of BMI. OK, and where you sit on that is largely determined by your genes, your gene variants. Of course, what's happened over the last five decades is that the whole curve has shifted to the right. And the main reason for that, as you all know, is the obesogenic environment, or primarily food abundance. So when there's food abundance, the curve sits over here towards the right. When there's food scarcity and famine, the curve sits here over here on the left. But the point is, regardless of whether there's famine or food abundance, in any population, is this Gaussian distribution, as with any other polygenic or complex 
biological traits and Gaussian distribution, okay? There's a really fundamental point that I want to get across to you. Yes, heritability of BMI in no way challenges the notion that there's an obesity epidemic and that the curve shifted to the right. Of course, we've all become fatter over the last few decades. But the point to make here is that where you sit on that curve is largely genetically determined. I hope I've made that, uh, made that very clear. Why should we study genetics? Well, hopefully it could help to destigmatize human obesity. Hopefully, if we understand that it's largely genetically driven, then we'll understand that it's not necessarily down to greed, being sloth-like or gluttonous, the various vices which are often attributed to obesity, but rather it's a medical condition which is genetically driven, a little bit like height. Obesity uh, should be seen as a biomedical disorder, not simply as moral frailty, and I think understanding of genetics can help with that. It's clearly resulted in dramatically successful therapies in a few individuals with monogenic forms of obesity, and we'll come on to some examples of that later. It's provided great insight into the pathogenesis of obesity and specifically about appetite regulation, uh, like, for example, melanocortin-4 receptor gene mutations, which are thought to be some of the commonest causes of monogenic obesity. And again, we'll come on to that later. It can provide insight into pathogenesis and treatment of weight-related conditions as well, and could hopefully uh, set the road for, the for a future possible uh, genetic based therapies, okay? So if we can identify genetic defects, we can hopefully in future uh, manipulate those directly, even in early childhood or even in babyhood, for example, before weight gain has occurred. So in other words, we can identify patients at risk of weight gain in later life and do something about that to try and mitigate against the weight gain uh, just through uh, genotyping them. So that all of these things are potentially possible uh, through having a really good understanding of genetic to obesity. It could also help to predict future onset of obesity and, of course, could enable focus prevention and avoidance of weight gain through lifestyle measures, for example, and other uh, therapies in those genetically most at risk. Now, a lot of these on the second part of this slide, we don't really do now. These are really future concerns. And I think in the future, when we do our genetic, when we do our obesity clinics, currently, clearly, genetics doesn't really feature much at all uh, in most of our clinics. But I think in the future, I suspect it will. Now, in terms of the types of genetic uh, mediators of obesity, these can be broadly divided into two. So there's monogenic conditions. Uh, these can be syndromic or they can be non-syndromic, but as its name suggests, it's a defect within one gene which leads to uh, weight gain, often associated with other problems as well. This is clearly Mendelian genetics or more commonly polygenic. In other words, multiple gene, facts, gene defects which can have relatively minor effects, but in, in, uh, when, when considered together, uh, they determine ultimate BMI. And these are non-Mendelian, uh, result in complex traits, as we discussed a couple of slides ago when we were talking about the bell-shaped curve. Now, each of these have interaction with the environment, the so-called genotype environment interaction, and this combination ultimately results in our uh, BMI. Of course, phenotype in this concept of visible, property of an organism produced by interaction of the genotype with the environment. In this case, the phenotype, of course, is weight or obesity. As we've heard, uh, so it's in syndromic effects, monogenic, polygenic, and these can interact with the environment, environmental factors shown here. Three pillars of environment, essentially food, what we eat, okay? Uh, sleep, really important, or I guess in, from an environmental perspective, uh, whether we live in a, a noisy environment or whether there's too much light pollution, for example, anything that impacts on our sleep, and also, of course, physical activity. So the three pillars of lifestyle, which all of which are influenced by environment, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps most relevant, as we heard earlier, food abundance, okay? Uh, food abundance, which, which is incredibly important. Now, when we think about monogenic forms of obesity, as we've heard, this is typically uh, a problem within one gene, a genetic defect within, within one gene. These often account for severe forms of obesity. They typically run in families and they're often, you often find it developing in children. Remember, of course, you're born with this genetic defect. So the appetite dysregulation occurs from birth and you often get progressive or significant weight gain in a child and an adolescent. So the take home message here in your clinics, if you have a patient who's developed early onset childhood severe obesity, who has super morbid obesity, and they have a strong family history of obesity, 
then those are the kinds of patients we should be thinking about doing uh, monogenic screening for. As we'll come on to later, these often result in defects within the society centers of the brain controlling appetite. They can often result in small chemical changes in the DNA uh, with subtle variants which can result in severe early onset obesity. They can also associate with enzymatic changes as well, uh, with, which associate with insulin resistance, ENPP1, for example. And finally, there can be chromosomal defects as well. There can be chromosomal regions which can be affected as well. Uh, for example, this one shown here, 6Q16.3, which can associate with uh, obesity and diabetes. Here are some examples of monogenic forms of obesity. The top one there is a syndromic, syndromic form, Cohen syndrome which is a defect within the COH1 gene, which results in uh, neurodevelopmental delay, muscle atrophy, and uh, progressive significant weight gain, often in adolescence. Uh, really quite rare, as all of these examples are. They're obviously relatively rare. Leptin deficiency, which we'll consider in the next slide. Leptin receptor deficiency, pro-hormone converters one deficiency, pro-opium melanocortin deficiency, and melanocortin-4 receptor mutations. All of these, all of these shown here, influence in some way the central appetite regulation and we'll come on to the relevance of that shortly. Here is, a, here is an example, probably the best example you could give of why it's important to identify monogenic forms of obesity. Why is it important? Well it's important because you could have literally a life transformative effect on that patient through specific therapies. In this example, it's leptin deficiency, congenital leptin deficiency described by our colleagues in Cambridge, Sada Faruqi in Journal of Endocrinology. It's hard to believe, is it, is it not, that these two images are taken from exactly the same patient. On the left-hand side, a three-year-old child weighing 42 kilograms, born with congenital leptin deficiency. They were given recombinant leptin therapy over four years, and four years later, at the age of seven, shown on the right-hand side, weight has gone down by 32 kilograms, look like, looks like an entirely different child. But this is an example of how you can transform a patient's life uh, through the example here of the prominent leptin treatment. Clearly, if, they, if this child here had not been identified as having leptin deficiency, they would never have been treated with leptin, and a lot, all, in all likelihood, their weight would have gone up and up, and clearly that would have had a huge impact on morbidity and, of course, mortality. So, what better example to give of the importance of considering and screening for monogenic forms of obesity. What about polygenic obesity? Well, this is where we're all much more familiar and we all kind of tend to be much happier with this because it's kind of bread and butter of what we do day in, day out in, our, in all of our obesity clinics. This is so-called common uh, obesity, as its name suggests, multiple gene defects, uh, often with um, uh, quite minor effects on BMI, but cumulatively they can have a big effect. Now, there's now been over 400 studies, believe it or not, 400 genetic studies, which have identified over 130 candidate genes which have been linked with obesity-related phenotypes. These effects can, of course, impact on body weight and BMI, but also body composition, fat distribution, energy expenditure, changes in body weight and composition. And we have some insights from mouse models as well. Of course, much of our understanding of polygenic obesity has been informed by genome-wide association studies. And in fact, defects within the FTO gene, I should say variants within the FTO gene, was in fact the first uh, um, um, signal identified for polygenic obesity um, in Oxford uh, now uh, well over uh, 10 years ago. Now, there can be, there's two diff different ways of looking at this. You can get relatively common genetic changes, so-called common variant, common disease model, or you can get multiple rare variants, which can also uh, result in common disease. The point really is that it doesn't really matter whether it's common variants or rare variants. The point is that you have multiple gene defects, all of which would combine uh, to result in enhancement of appetite or uh, some change in appetite regulation, which ultimately uh, determines one's uh, BMI. Here's an example of uh, some data from a genome-wide association study. And for those of you who are not familiar with uh, these types of data, this is uh, uh, called a Manhattan plot for uh, obvious reasons, just to um, orientate you here. Each of these columns or skyscrapers, if you like, is a different chromosome, right? And each of these different dots is a different SNP or single nucleoside polypeptide uh, within uh, each of the genes, so the 20,000 genes in the human genome, and of course, a genome-wide association study assesses all of those and multiple SNPs in each gene. 
Now on the y-axis is the p-values, and it's important to note here that these p-values up here are far, far more stringent than what we're used to. So we're all used to having p equals 0.05, uh, in other words, one in 20 chance uh, of the null hypothesis, uh, which many studies use. But when it comes to GWAS, because there's literally tens or even hundreds of thousands of signals, because of the Bonferroni effect, you have to be much more stringent in your kind of where you set the bar. Otherwise, it would just be swamped by you know, uh, tons of signals which are not actually relevant. So they set the bar very high, as you can see. Uh, this log values, the, the different hours here shown here. And you can see one of the most uh, highly, um, um, uh, one of the most powerful signals is from FTO, as we've heard, but also featuring here NC4 receptors as well, and POMC, as I said, which we'll come on to uh, shortly. Importantly, there are pleiotropic associations of common GWAS variants. They don't all just affect obesity. Of course they don't. There's overlap with uh, signals of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia. Indeed, the FTO variant actually came about from a GWAS for type 2 diabetes, and it was only identified as a variant for BMI when they adjusted for BMI in the analyses between type 2 diabetes and control cohort. So remember, yes, it's a, a gene variant which impacts on BMI, but it was actually discovered from a GWAS on type 2 diabetes. And you can see here, FTO is shown here, look. Uh, so there's overlap, okay? Now, of course, some of this overlap may be mediated by the effects of uh, the gene variant on BMI, of course, if this is a causing increased BMI, then of course it will tend to uh, result in metabolic dysfunction. Uh, but there may be some uh, BMI independent effects as well. Now, a really important point to make here is that you might say to me, okay, well, that's all very well. We know that there's, you know, there's genetic variants which contribute to obesity. Um, what does that tell us about, what does that insight does that give us about pathogenesis, you know? If we don't know how these genes are actually affecting obesity. Why is it important? Well, actually, it turns out that we do have a lot of insight into how many of these genes are impacting on body weight. And it turns out that many of these genes, in fact, the majority as shown here from this study, are actually expressed within the central nervous system, within the brain and central nervous system, okay? So the current theory and, uh, is that, you know, m many of these gene variants which impact on BMI are actually doing it via the central nervous system. In other words, the central control of appetite and metabolism. So I can't, that's a really important take home message from the whole talk, okay? Is that yes, genetics is important for obesity. And actually this is largely relevant because of the central control of appetite. This is shown schematically on this slide. And if you can understand this slide, you can understand pretty much everything there is to know about central control of appetite. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time going through it, because I think it's so important. Right, so on the left-hand side, shown here on the lower part of the slide is a depiction of the hypothalamus. On the left-hand side is the main pathway which is involved in appetite suppression. POMC, or pro-opio-melanocortin, we're all used to hearing about that in its, in its role in the pituitary. Of course, it's a precursor hormone for ACTH, adrenocorticotrophic hormone, but it's also expressed within the hypothalamus and it plays a central role in appetite regulation. POMC is broken down by pro-hormone convertase 1 into its constituent parts, alpha, beta, and gamma melanocyte stimulate hormone, stimulating hormone and ACTH. Gamma MSH then stimulates the melanocortin 3 and 4 receptors, and this is the mechanism where appetite becomes suppressed. Okay, you can see here, reduction of feeding. There's another pathway adjacent, which is called the agouti-related peptide, which has the opposite effect, and this actually stimulates appetite, okay? But we're just gonna focus on the appetite suppression part for now. Now, peripherally, within the adipose tissue, there's a release of this hormone called leptin, this adipokine leptin, and this crosses the blood-brain barrier, and it stimulates leptin receptors within the hypothalamus. Why is this important? Well, the leptin is basically a signal which tells the brain how much adipose tissue you have. Levels of leptin in the blood, the blood are commensurate with how much adipose tissue you have. Think of leptin as a hormone of reassurance. It does actually a lot more than appetite regulation. One example is in women who lose a lot of weight, become underweight, they often become amenorrheic, uh, have anovulation. And this is actually an evolutionary thing, okay? Because if you have very little adipose tissue, you don't really want to become pregnant because it's obviously going to be potentially harmful, you're potentially not going to survive that. 
it's not going to be good for the fetus. So evolution is endowed us with a process whereby leptin deficiency or leptin, low levels of leptin, uh, where when there's kind of uh, weight loss uh, and uh, lack of adipose tissue, this kind of switches off the reproductive axis. But in the case of appetite, okay, leptin simulates this receptor here in the hypothalamus and it simulates this appetite suppression system. When leptin levels go down, then obviously there's less stimulation and so appetite becomes enhanced. So the question you're going to ask me, I'm sure, is that why is it then when you gain a lot of weight and you become obese, your leptin levels go up, which indeed they do. Why is it the case then that lept high leptin levels in obesity does not suppress appetite? And the reason is that as with insulin resistance, there's also something called leptin resistance. And in patients with morbid obesity and obesity gain weight, their, their sensitivity to leptin diminishes. And so the leptin, although there's, there's much more leptin in the system, its effect is diminished, okay? It's blunted by this leptin resistance. And so there's lack of this suppression of appetite. So appetite becomes enhanced and that's why obesity can often be a runaway thing. Okay, weight gain can go up and up and ultimately why patients develop BMIs of 60s and 70s and beyond. There's no kind of effective break mechanism once you get to that stage. So I hope I've kind of explained this to everyone. And the relevant, one of the important things here is that each of these different aspects of this appetite suppressant pathway uh, can be influenced by monogenic defects, which can lead to monogenic forms of obesity. So for example, as we've heard, leptin resistance, or sorry, sorry leptin deficiency, leptin resistance, defects in pro-opium melanocortin, defect deficiencies in pro-hormone convertase 1, deficiencies in alpha MSH, and most commonly, defects within the MC4 receptor, which are thought to possibly contribute to possibly tens of thousands of cases of obesity, probably many of which haven't actually been identified. We all probably have the odd patient with an MC4 receptor uh, problem that we don't know about, right? PC1 is interesting because this, these patients often present with very fair skin and ginger hair uh, because in addition to affecting appetite, it also influences alpha MSH, which influences melanin production in the skin. So they have often very fair skin and ginger hair. So remember, PC1 uh, can present in that way. Now, clearly that's an oversimplification. It's much more complicated. There are many signals which can impact, impact on appetite. Ghrelin, which comes from the fundus of the stomach, impacts on the agouti, stimulates the agouti-related peptide and stimulates appetite. There are also appetite-inhibiting hormones such as CCK, PYY, GLP-1, coming from the gut, uh, a case of gut peptides following a meal. This puts a break on appetite as well, acting again in the hypothalamic appetite centers. Uh, we've heard about leptin already and also Energy expenditure as well can also influence appetite. Of course, there are hedonic centers as well, which are entirely separate from hypothalamus, which account for why many of our patients eat overeat because of the pleasure effects that they get from eating, uh, so-called comfort eating. And this is an entirely separate pathway. We're only thinking here specifically about appetite control. So an obvious question then is, okay, so we've talked about genetics, but actually, despite all of the two-off studies that have been done, we can only account for around 8 percent the total heritability of BMI. So the obvious question is uh, where is the remaining 90% of the heritability of obesity actually lurking? Where is the dark matter? The analogy here is like the universe. Only 4% of matter in the universe, so-called baryonic material, uh, is actually known about. Okay, The vast majority of it is formed in the form of dark energy and dark matter, which is entirely elusive. Okay, And the similar thing, I think, analogy is in the case of genetics. Of course, we all remember that uh, a very simplified version here, the genome is essentially the hardware. Okay? So a gene produces a protein. When it's mutated, it either produces an abnormal protein or no protein at all. Let's think about epigenetics, because this is like the software. Okay, So surrounding each of the genes uh, and within the chromatin of the uh, chromosome are proteins like methyl groups and histones, which are attached to the chromatin and influence the expression of genes, and this is the key concept. It's the expressibility of each gene. In other words, the epigenome can influence, can either turn on or turn off gene transcription. It doesn't affect the genes themselves or the hardware, it's the software and it influences gene transcription. Now we're most susceptible to changes in our epigenome during fetal development. So for example, if your mother experiences famine when you're developing in utero, your own epigenome can overreact and upregulate genes for food storage and utilization, which can actually have a knock-on effect during a child and adult life. Okay, so what you experience in utero 
can impact on, it can become manifest during your life, largely down to the epigenome. What's fascinating, what I find absolutely fascinating about this is that genetic imprinting through the genome can actually be passed down through multiple generations. It's not just what your parents experience, it's what your grandparents experience and potentially even great grandparents. In other words, the environment of your parents and grandparents and previous generations actually becomes manifest in you, which is an incredible thought, isn't it? Now, actually, we all went through medical school thinking that Lamarck was completely wrong, right? Lamarckism was ridiculous. But actually, when it comes to the epigenome, maybe Lamarck had a point, right? Maybe the environment of our parents and grandparents actually is relevant and it has some impact on how we express our genes through the epigenome. So just maybe some of the hidden dark matter uh, and hidden heritability may be mediated through epigenetic effects. In addition to that, there is huge complexity within the gut microbiota, probably over around 10 trillion cells in the microbiota, which have importance on regulating immune health, gut wall permeability and inflammatory reactions within the adipose tissue. Think of this as an organ in itself, uh, in, impacted by environment and most importantly by our diet. We should all be eating a high fiber diet. Uh, here's a review that I wrote recently. If you're interested, you can look at this and do some more reading. Eubiosis, so good kind of, um, um, uh, uh, kind of uh, kind of eubiotic relationship within the gut, important in relation to metabolic byproducts like small chain fatty acids, which can stimulate the production of GLP-1, for example, and impact appetite control. There's also effects on emotionality and anxiety, for example, and crosstalk between the uh, brain through vagal afferents, for example, uh, bile acid effects as well, and inflammatory effects. Conversely, this virus is shown on the right, where you get, can get a leaky gut, endotoxemia, inflammatory reactions, colorectal cancer, impaired immunity, and insulin resistance in dysmetabolic processes. Now, it's relevant in genetics because it's possible to look at the genome of the microbiome, so-called metagenomics, through shotgun analysis, for example, and I think this is likely to feature more in future management of obesity. Now, of course, each gene has its reduced the protein, and when you look at the protein-protein interactions, it gets incredibly complex. Here's a schematic of the protein-protein interactions uh, for obesity-related BWAS-associated genes. And it's obvious from looking at this, that if you change one of those proteins, you can't just do it in isolation. It has, it's part of a very complex web. And when you then throw in epigenetics and metagenomics, protein-protein interactions, environmental effects, monogenic, polygenic effects, and so on. And being human, of course, where we're susceptible to seeing patterns when patterns don't exist, it's an incredibly complex uh, scenario. Einstein said, out of complexity, find simplicity. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. One of the key challenges for the future will be to try and make sense of all this kind of tangled web of data. I am aware of the time and I don't wanna, I don't wanna overrun. I think we've got about 10 minutes left, but we're just gonna use as a segue now into the next part of the talk, the idea of weight maintenance. We all know that maintenance of body weight is incredibly challenging. And one of the reasons for this is that you get persistent changes in the appetite hormones when we lose weight. Ghrelin, which is the main promoter of hunger, goes up and it stays up for at least a year following weight loss. The appetite suppressant hormones, GLP-1 and PYY, go down and they stay down for at least a year following weight loss, okay? And this results in enhanced appetite over time. And this is one of the main biological reasons why most of us regain weight once we've lost weight. And this is borne out from some of the uh, major trials over the years. Here's one example of the follow-on data from the diabetes prevention program. Over 10 year follow-up, you can see the weight loss through lifestyle shown in purple. And then over time, the progressive weight gain in the lifestyle group. You can choose many of the studies like Look Ahead, for example, which showed exactly the same. Pretty much any study which looks at lifestyle shows this kind of Nike tick configuration, initial weight loss and progressive weight gain. We know that uh, diets are good in the short term generally, as you can see, these different studies, weight loss through dieting and lifestyle shown in dark blue, but five to seven years later shown in light blue, in every single case there was weight regain, and in one or two cases the weight actually overshot, okay, what the baseline level was. So 90% of us who lose weight regain the weight over time, and it's down primarily, as I said, to appetite enhancement. This is a key challenge in my view, one of the key challenges of obesity management. It's relatively easy to lose weight. It's incredibly difficult to maintain weight. And I don't think, to be fair, I don't think we really have the answers to this. I know there are examples of um, Fender and Samagotai, for example, some really excellent data coming through. 
But these drugs only work as long as you take them. Once you stop the drugs, the weight goes back up. Bariatric surgery, in my view, is probably the only long-term solution that we have, I think, uh, to obesity. The problem, of course, with bariatric surgery is not a scalable solution to the population. So we have to think about novel ways of managing this. And one way could be uh, mindfulness. Just to introduce you to the concept, mindfulness stems from Buddhism. It's a hyper-awareness of now, without judging, just experiencing way of living. There's been a huge increase in uh, the publications on mindfulness over recent years. You can see here uh, an order of magnitude increase with exponential rise. It's hugely relevant now. We looked at this in our own service, and at this point, I'd like to acknowledge our excellent team at uh, Coventry. Uh, my colleague, who I supervise, Dr. Hansen, coordinated the study, uh, but it was also with my excellent colleague, uh, Mr. Menon, as well, as I'm sure you, you'll all know, uh, very prominent in uh, the Bonds Society. And we should look here, look at the weight loss, a case of three, over three kilograms weight loss through mindfulness intervention. These patients who had mindfulness improved their eating behavior and enhanced weight loss and improved confidence and self-compassion, okay? So mindfulness works. There's been other reviews of mindfulness-based uh, uh, studies, some mixed results, but showing some benefits on depression, for example, anxiety and stress, and some longer-term uh, studies as well, which are required, okay? So mindfulness helps us to regulate our awareness, to self-regulate our emotional control, for example, and our attentional control. All these things are incredibly important for uh, really trying to address the surge in appetite uh, once we lose weight, okay? Mindfulness, I think, in my view, is a really important part of what we should all be doing. It's not, just, it's not enough just to tell patients what to eat and what not to eat and to do more exercise. We have to give them the tools to actually enable that to happen. And we have to be aware that we're actually, they're actually facing an uphill challenge because of the biological changes which are basically enhancing their appetite and driving them to eat more. We have to think outside of the box. Very interesting study on uh, meditation, the form of mindfulness, showing simulation in these different regions of the brain uh, which are involved in attentional control and emotional regulation and self-awareness. Mindfulness can lead to changes in self-awareness, a more positive self-representation, higher self-esteem, higher acceptance of oneself, a move from self-referential processing to a self-detached and more objective analysis of life events, which I think is can be very helpful, not just in the obesity setting, uh, but in many aspects of healthcare and indeed life in general. Changes in your emotional regulation then, uh, uh, this can, um, uh, as we've heard, um, result in decreased emotional eating, improved healthy uh, lifestyle choices, including dietary choices and alterations in reward processing as well. I'm gonna, now on the subject of, of Buddhism, because mindfulness stems from Buddhism, I'm gonna leave you with one of my favorite quotes from the uh, Buddha. And while you read that, I'll just summarize the talk. This is the last slide. We've been through a lot in this talk. We've covered a lot of ground. We've, think, we've thought about the relevance of genetics of obesity. Uh, we've talked about the fact that it really often gets ignored. I don't think it's given enough airtime that it should be. The media don't seem to understand about genetics of obesity, or if they do, they don't talk about it. It's all down to lifestyle. It's very relevant. We should all be aware of it. Of course, monogenic forms are quite rare. Most of us won't see many of them, but we need to be alert to the possibility. And in those patients who we think may have maybe at a high chance, we should screen for it. And as we've heard, in the case of leptin deficiency, for example, there is an incredibly effective treatment option. Uh, we've talked about the complexities of epigenetics and metagenomics and where all the dark matter might be hidden. And we've talked about the challenges of weight maintenance and how uh, mindfulness may be one small part of addressing that. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank Mr. Awad uh, once again for his kind invitation and the Bonds Council. I'm very happy to take any uh, questions in the remaining 10 minutes. Thank you. Tom, thank you very, very much for a fantastic and really, really uh, inspiring talk. Um, we've had a few, a couple of questions come through. I'm going to hand over to Peter. Uh, if you can just stop sharing your screen, Tom. Yeah, of course, yeah. Oh, that explains why I can't see myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Tom. Uh, um, I'm a simple surgeon, and you've just blown my mind away, as long with many others. Um, the, there is a question that's coming on our, our, our thing from Amanya Meridunska. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. 
insulin resistance is amenable to dietary changes and physical exercise. Mm -hmm. Is there a parallel with leptin resistance? Yeah, no, it's, it's a really, it's a really good question. Okay. And uh, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, insulin resistance is a kind of a dynamic thing and it's interesting. If I, if I do a run around the block, then my insulin sensitivity will improve acutely. It's incredibly malleable to kind of, or uh, sensitive really to anything we do. In relation to leptin resistance, I'm not aware of any data which shows equivalent kind of acute effect, if you like, on leptin sensitivity. My understanding and I, you know, I'd need to, I need to kind of do a detailed search in the literature to be absolutely 100% sure in this. But my understanding is that leptin resistance is much more of a kind of uh, prolonged effect, and it's very much down to the kind of, uh, kind of the, the, the if you are obese, then it tends to lead to leptin resistance, and I think it can be reversible. So if you lose weight, I think you can regain leptin sensitivity, which is obviously a good thing because you can then help to suppress appetite. Okay, uh, you know, but but I mean, obviously. Um, as we've seen, uh, there are other changes which occur with weight loss, as we've heard, uh, suppression in, in PYY, suppression in GLP-1, enhancement of, of ghrelin, which are going to basically confound the whole thing. So even if leptin resistance improves, it's going to be uh, kind of scuppered really by these other changes. Uh, but, you know, but yeah, it's an interesting question. As I, I think the short answer is I don't think we can make too many comparisons with insulin resistance. I think probably, just, if I can just button on Sheriff before he <laughs> gets his question in. Um, again, back to my simplistic surgical mind. Uh, I get your graph about the Gaussian distribution of weight. Mm. And when you're in a famine situation, it goes down. When you're in the food of uh, years of plenty, it goes up. Mm. Um, if you go back to that child that had the, the leptin deficiency uh, mm -hmm. and not successfully treated, had he been in the period of famine, would he have still been severely obese? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. And I think, I think what I should probably have made clear is that the, the Gaussian distribution idea only really works with polygenic obesity or for that matter, any other complex biological traits. It's a bit like saying, okay, weight at height on, you know, in most of us is, you know, is what we inherit from our parents. But if you, if you inherit, a, you know, if you have a pituitary tumor which you produce, you know, excess growth hormone as a child, you'll get pituitary gigantism regardless of what your parents' height is, right? So it's an anomaly. It's a monogenic thing. So in, in that, in the monogenic form, it doesn't really fit with what I was saying for the majority of us. But in answer to your question, uh, yeah, so, so regardless of the Gaussian thing, yeah, I mean, if, if that child was in a famine situation, then... Clearly, he wouldn't have looked like what we showed, right? He's that big, presumably because he's had access to food abundance. And in addition to that, he's got a voracious appetite. Yeah. If you've got a voracious appetite and you're living in a famine, right, you're not going to gain weight unless you can in somehow access more food than other people have got, right? Which I guess you might. But yeah, so I think it all depends on... It, this is a great example of where the kind of genotype uh, environment interaction comes into play. It's a very good illustration of that. And, and you really need both of them to actually uh, de uh, develop that extreme phenotype, I think. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Peter. So, Tom, I was going to ask you about the um, uh, genetic screening services. They're available mm -hmm. in the UK. How we yeah, yeah. yeah, sure. Can you just give us a bit more information on that? Yeah, well, I'm actually only aware of one, and that's our colleagues in, in Cambridge, right? So they, so, so basically, any patient who, um, uh, in, in Coventry over the years, if we've identified a potential patient with monogenic forms of obesity, we basically refer to our colleagues in, in Cambridge, uh, uh, Sarah Faruqi, for example, I think, runs the uh, Goose or Genetics of Obesity Study. Uh, and I think, um, you know, that, let's face it, they're the world experts in this, right? literally the world leaders in this whole field. Um, you know, there's not many centres that have the experience or expertise of actually giving recombinant leptin, right? Cambridge, right? That's basically the, where, where it's given. I'm not aware of any, other, I mean, I'm, there may be the centres around the place, but I, th I think, um, yeah, so I think that's uh, that's where, the only one that I really know about, to be honest. I, so, is um, that, so if we see an 18-year-old in clinic, because not many of us will deal with childhood obesity, there's... Mm -hmm. uh, three maybe um, centres in the UK, but if we deal, if we see an 18 year old and we take a history and they've had this long history of obesity and we see yeah. one family, so yeah. would we, and we think, ah, genetic screening, where yeah. do we that patient? To Cambridge? Or yes, what would we do? absolutely, yeah, to Cambridge. Yeah. And, and I think, um, 
you know, um, and they'll they'll do like a, a, a const, you know, they'll basically do a screen for known uh, gene uh, variants, right? And I, th I think the other, an important point here is obviously they can. It's an obvious thing to say, but they can only screen for what's known, right? It's almost certain that there are you know, many other monogenic forms of obesity which we don't know about yet, right? And it's bound to be. I mean, I'm sure we don't know everything there is to know about monogenic obesity. And, you know, it'll only be a matter of time before I think new variants will will come up and you know, we'll, we'll find new variants. And it's a really fascinating. You know, as I said earlier, I mean, almost certainly all of us have got some, at least a handful or one or two at least of monogenic conditions that we don't actually know about because of course we can't screen for everyone can we? it's healthy economically it's not going to work it's basically going to swamp the, the health budget if we screen everyone for you know monogenic so we have to be very selective um, but of course the downside of that selection is that we are ultimately inevitably i think uh, going to miss the odd one and as i said it's thought the mc4 receptor is probably the most common form of monogenic BC, you know, they probably there are uh, you know almost certainly not all of those are actually diagnosed so there's probably a lot of, out there that aren't known about so we've mm -hmm. had just one question comes through which is related because it, it applies mm -hmm. so, so i'll just post it so what's the best specific question or measures that you'd ask in an adult to mm -hmm. to um to identify a candidate uh, for monogenic monogenetic screening yeah. Yeah, well, as with most things in medicine, I think the key is really in the history. Um, you know, you have to take a very detailed history, and specifically, when did they start to gain weight? You know, was it from early childhood? Did they have an extreme, you know, weight gain during early childhood? Did they have a voracious appetite? You know, did they do they have uh, parents who are morbidly obese or you know uh, strong family history? You know, it's the usual kind of suspect as with any genetic condition: a detailed family history uh, and a detailed account of you know timing of of weight gain and that kind of thing. There are obviously other clues as well as I kind of intimated in the talk. Uh, you know, PC one uh, enzyme deficiencies. You know, uh, ginger hair, fair skin. That's a you know obviously syndromic uh, effect. If you you know. Bada Willie, for example, you know, typical uh, syndrome. There are obviously various syndromes which are associated with with um, uh, with uh, weight gain and obesity as well. And obviously, to look for those, obviously, in in clinical examination history taking. So I think those those are kind of the best kind of things I could say. Obviously, uh, medicine being medicine, there's always an exception to the rule, and it's very difficult to you know cover everyone just with a simple answer to that question. But though, in kind of general terms, I think that's what we should be doing. Okay, we've got literally a couple of minutes left, so I'll hand over to Peter to perhaps ask the final question. Thanks, Tom. Um, there's a question come in from Ahmed Ahmed. Uh, my problem is I know two Ahmed Ahmeds, so I'm not sure which one this <laughs> is. <laughs> However, the, the, the question from Ahmed is that some genetic mutations are linked to poor response in bariatric surgery. Mm. So, should we be screening genetically before we put them to surgery to make sure we get the best responders? Yeah, it's a bit of a loaded question. I guess the question I, I would throw back is, are we referring here to kind of monogenic forms of obesity or are we referring to other kind of genetic variants which are, uh, you know, um, kind of not necessarily monogenic or rare? I, I think, you know, it's, it's a tricky one. I think in general terms, my feeling is that if we can get insight into how someone's going to respond to bariatric surgery, in general terms, right, it, I think we'd all agree it's better to know that before you go in there with surgery than after, right? I think, you know, I think we'd all probably agree with that. So um, I, I, in, it is kind of predictors of response as well. Of course, yes. Yeah, so I, in answer to Ahmed, yeah, look, if there are, if we can identify gene variants, which, you know, suggest that, they, you know, how a patient will respond to surgery, yes, of course, it would be, uh, you know, a good, good thing potentially to look at that. Uh, before surgery but i guess um again it kind of comes down to health economics as well isn't it and well you know i mean it's sh surely that individual even if they've got a genetic problem that's causing their obesity will be better off having the surgery to yeah. reduce the weight rather than allow them to continue <laughs> on their yes yes you could you could make the argument as well i guess um I think you'd need to look at the data in more detail and you'd need to really have studies to really look at this and and, and the, the gene defects, you know, variants in, in question we need to look at in more and see the effects it would have. So, in in Armour's defence, he was talking <laughs> about uh, demand on the NHS and not enough. Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> I, I just, I just, Tom, just yeah. very, very mm. briefly, and it is an important topic, and it doesn't, it's not fair to ask you this in the last uh, minute or two, but there's been three or four comments about obesity stigma, and clearly, mm. data uh, and that that it is genetics that leads to most of the heritability mm. of BMI. Uh, that's that's gold dust in terms of uh, our efforts to try to reduce obesity stigma. So, mm. how can we get the message out there better? And also, how can we do it in a balanced way so that patients don't just turn up to clinic and blame it on, it's on my genes, I can't help yeah. it. Yeah, well, that's a really good question. I mean, I, I, I don't think there's any easy, simple solution to that, but I think it has to take, I think, you know, it has to be a cultural change. It's not going to happen overnight. I think we have to do a lot of investment in educating our children uh, in schools, for example, the next generation and, the, you know, the nature of EST. Uh, I think I, I think the media has a, have a lot to answer for, frankly. I think, you know, the media, you know, what a lot of us, uh, understand and think about a VC, the man off the street, probably a lot of it comes from the media, right? And the media stigmatise a VC, there's, there's no doubt about it. When they have anything on a VC, they show stigmatised images of a, a beast, uh, you know, buttocks or someone eating a, a, a donut or something, or, or a decapitated image of, you know, it's, it, I think we'll look back at this in years to come and we'll think that's utterly unacceptable at the moment. These images are acceptable, no one questions it. I think that, that has to change. I think as healthcare professionals, we, I guess there's some onus is on us to help to educate uh, journalists and so on about the importance of genetics and, and the importance of destigmatizing obesity. Okay, I mean, if we're going on all, 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 I know we have to finish, but obviously lobbying government as well, I guess, uh, you know, uh, and because at the end of the day, you know, stigma affects this on all levels. You could argue that one of the reasons why there's so few so little funding for obesity, including bariatric surgery, uh, is probably down to, or largely down to stigmatization. So of course, that affects the, uh, you know, the policymakers as well as everyone else. So I think, you know, that there's tons that needs to be done, but ultimately it's going to be cultural change and that's going to take probably years, probably decades to change. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, we must draw it there. So thank you ever so much, Tom, for um, giving us a fascinating talk. Peter, for chairing, all of you for attending, and Medtronic for supporting. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks for the next Journal Club. Good night, all. Thank you very much.